the death of Saul, when David had returned from striking down the Amalekites, David remained two days in Ziklag. And on the third day, behold, a man came from Saul's camp with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And when he came to David, he fell to the ground and paid homage. David said to him, where do you come from? And he said to him, I have escaped from the camp of Israel. And David said to him, how did it go? Tell me. And he answered, the people fled from the battle. And also many of the people have fallen and are dead. And Saul and his son Jonathan are also dead. Then David said to the young man who told him, how do you know that Saul and his son Jonathan are dead? And the young man who told him said, by chance I happened to be on Mount Gelboa. And there was Saul leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen were close upon him. And when he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me, and I answered him, Here am I, here I am. And he said to him, Who are you? And he, he said, answer, I answered him, I am an Amalekite. And he said to me, Stand beside me and kill me, for anguish has seized me, and yet my life still lingers. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. And I took the crown that was on his head and the armlet that was on his arm, and I had brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold of the, his clothes and tore them, and so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned, and they wept and fasted until evening for Saul, and for Jonathan his son, and for the people of, of the Lord, and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. And David said to the young man who told him, Where did you come from? And he answered, I am the son of a sojourner, an Amalekite. And David said to him, How is it you were not afraid to put your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? And then David called one of the young men and said, Go execute him. And he struck him down so that he died. And David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your own mouth has testified against you, saying, I have killed the Lord's anointed. Father, we pray that you would use these words to teach us to guide us, to show yourself, your character, who you are to us, Father. Help us to submit to these words and to love them, to understand them deeply, and so understand you deeply, Father. I pray you would give me the words to speak, that they would not be my own, but they would be yours. And that should anything false come from my mouth, Father, that you would stop it dead on the ears of those who listen, so that only your truth is heard. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, it has been, well, let's see, how long has it been? Four months? It's been four months. We've been working through Titus at the beginning of the summer. Throughout the summer, we worked through uh, 12 of the book, uh, 12 of the chapters of the book of Psalms. And finally, we're back into the book of Samuel. And so it would be really good for us to have a bit of a refresher to see where we've been before we move forward. See, first Samuel opens at a time before Israel has a king, but quickly it moves to Israel's demand for a king so that they could be like all the other nations around them. Basically, their request was to usurp the Lord as their king and to put a human king in God's place. And so God chooses Saul. He goes along with Israel. He chooses Saul to be their king, a man who was taller and more handsome than any other in Israel. In other words... He looked like a king. But within six chapters, we begin to realize he may look the part, but he does not act the part. And eventually God rejects Saul for his disobedience and instead anoints David a king, as king. And though Saul continued to rule for quite some time afterward, and even David served Saul faithfully in his army, eventually... The two of them had a falling out, which is another way of saying very gently, Saul became jealous of David's success and popularity with the people, and so Saul tried to kill David on multiple occasions. And though Saul or uh, David had opportunities of his own to take Saul's life, he refused to raise his hand against Saul 
because Saul was, was still the Lord's anointed king. David let God deal with Saul and resisted any temptation to enact his own vengeance upon Saul. And this is really important to remember for us to understand the situation that happens in 2 Samuel chapter 1. And so by the end of 1 Samuel, David has been on the run from Saul for quite some time. And Saul is continually at war with the Philistines, still trying to figure out a way to kill David and get rid of him. And the closing of the book, um, and you can go back. We're not going to read it, but you can go back to the end of 1 Samuel. It actually tells us Saul and Jonathan's death in a battle against the Philistines. The same battle that the Amalekite comes from and he, he tells David about. Saul was badly wounded by an arrow And seeing that his death was near, he asked his armor bearer to kill him. And when the armor bearer refused, he took his own life. And so Saul and his sons were dead. The army of Israel was routed. And so ends 1 Samuel. Perfect ending. It's like one of those, right? Like, what's a good book, a good chapter? You got to read the next one to figure out what happens next, right? It's like this cliffhanger. And that's the end of 1 Samuel. It's a cliffhanger. What's going to happen to David? What's going to happen to Israel? Is David suddenly going to take over? Well, you got to read the next book to see. And strangely enough, this was actually one book, and so they cut it off at a perfect time. They broke it into, rumor has it there were two scrolls, and so that's why there's a First and Second Samuel. But there's supposed to be one book, one continuous story. And so Second Samuel opens up with David returning and resting from a battle of his own with the Amalekites, when ironically, an Amalekite brings news of Saul's death. And this man's account, I don't know if you noticed, is very different from the account of 1 Samuel chapter 31. But there's a reason for this contradiction. And this is a contradiction. Their stories differ. We may know the details of what happened to Saul, but David didn't know. And the Amalekite knew that David didn't know because David wasn't at the battle. And it seems he thought that David would be pleased to hear of his rival's death. Finally, David is free. He wanted to tell a story that would put him in David's good graces. But in the end, it only led to the Amalekite's death. His greed for David's favor... And his contempt for the Lord's anointed actually led to a judgment of death. So that's how we're working through this story today. This Amalekite enters David's camp with his clothes torn, dirt on his head. This is a clear indication he's mourning. He's not dirty from the the battle. He is mourning over the loss. He's mourning over uh, Saul and Jonathan's death. Now, there's no concrete evidence that the man truly didn't mourn, but the context, when you bring it all together, and even David himself later on in chapter 4 points out that this man's deceitfulness was very apparent. He was not truthful. This man hoped that his appearance of mourning would sway any misgivings of David not trusting him. He falls to the ground in in David's presence and he pays him homage, it says in the ESV. He pays him honor and respect that was normally only given to a king. His, his, His point was very obvious to David. That king's dead. Now you're gonna be king. Look what I've done for you. This is another piece of circumstantial evidence just to show this man's deceit because he knew that David was going to take Saul's place as king, which is why he hands over Saul's crown and his armlet. He doesn't give it to anybody. He gives it to the anointed king. Everybody, it seems like everybody, at least this Amalekite, if he's an Amalekite, he's not an Israelite. If he knew David was the anointed king, surely Israel understood that David was going to take Saul's place. Now, this being said, this man's appearance and story was intended to please David and earn him David's favor, but his greed would actually be his undoing. Because unlike the contempt that the Amalekite 
had for Saul. David held Saul with honor as the Lord's anointed king, even though Saul was trying to kill David. Twice, while on the run, David had the chance to take Saul's life. 1 Samuel 24 and 1 Samuel 26. And twice David refused to raise his hand. He held Saul's status as the Lord's anointed to be so sacred that to raise his hand against Saul was to raise his hand against the Lord. And so when this man tells his story of how he took Saul's life, even if he was commanded to do so, uh, do such a thing as by Saul himself, he was not showing his love for Saul. He was showing his contempt for Saul. He saw Saul as simply a man in the position of king. David saw Saul as a man, even a very flawed man, anointed and set apart by God to be the king of God's people. Those are two very different things. And so the Amalekites' own words sign his death warrant. After David hears the news of Saul's death, he and his men mourn, they weep, they fast until the evening. Um, for Jonathan, Saul, the, and even the people of Israel, they're realizing this is, this is a big, the king dies. This is a big change for the people of Israel. And they're hurting, and David is hurting for them and with them. But after their time of mourning was completed, David confronts the Amalekite. How is it that you were not afraid to put your hand out to destroy the Lord's anointed one? Your blood be on your head. For your mouth has testified, your own mouth has testified against you. And David commands one of his men to execute the Amalekite. See, our natural response when we hear this, at least maybe it's just me, but our natural response is to see, see David's verdict as cruel and a little bit of an overreaction, right? It's like you're... If you're a parent, your child disobeys you severely, and then you're like, all right, I'm going to kill you. I mean, that's what it feels like. That suddenly David just, you're dead. Wait. Even if the man took Saul's life, he was simply following Saul's orders. So why is he held accountable for it? And, and then let's say the man is lying. It's simply done to satisfy his own greed. He didn't actually kill anybody. So why would David kill him. Well, this line of thinking, though, also reveals our lack of understanding of what it means to be the anointed one of God, or just in general, God's anointing. In the Old Testament, the priests were anointed by God to set apart, to be set apart for the special duty of making sacrifices before God for the sins of the people and to teach the people the commands and laws of God. Only they were allowed to do that. No other tribe had that privilege. No other person had that privilege of coming before God and doing it because they were anointed by God. No other tribe was anointed by, by him. Saul was anointed by God. He was set apart for the special duty of leading, protecting, and caring for God's People. No one else in the nation of Israel was allowed such a privilege. He was king. And like the priests, the king was holy unto the Lord. Now, we may be saying, well, but David was the anointed king too. Yeah, but David subordinated himself to Saul. Saul was the first anointed king. And he says, you are my king. I'm going to follow you. And should God take your life, then I'll step into that role. But until that day comes, you are my anointed king because you were anointed by God. Like the priests, the king was holy unto the Lord. And to raise your hand against the king who was anointed by God himself is to raise your hand against God himself. David saw this. He understood this. He knew this, which is why he fled from Saul all the time. He refused to take his life. To take Saul's life is to usurp the authority of God. Again, in act, David refused to follow through. And even Saul's armor bearer, 
refused to take Saul's life. But the Amalekite, according to the Amalekite, had no problem with killing Saul. He didn't even hesitate. He goes, I walked up to him, I stood next to him, and then I killed him. And then I took his crown, and then I took his armlet, and and I did it because I knew that he was going to die anyway. So I might as well just do it, and then I can grab this stuff and and then bring it to you. How different from David's attitude, how different from the armor bearer's attitude. He should have been afraid to destroy the Lord's anointed because the penalty of such an act is death. His act of belittling and rejecting the Lord's anointed was a belittling and a rejection of God himself. Saul was not perfect. David was not perfect. But God had anointed both of them, in this case specifically Saul, to be his representative. He, in the, the, the position as king, was a representative of God to the people of God. And if those people kill the king, they are, in essence, belittling and looking down and rejecting God himself. Now, I know that's quite a statement to say that. But before we get into that, because then you go, okay, well, then how does that apply to us today? I feel like we, we need to point out a few dangers in interpreting biblical historical narratives. Okay, this is a, this is a biblical historical narrative. Now, we've, we're in Titus, which is um, it's called discourse. It's a teaching. It's a letter that is written, and it says, you know, you should believe this, you should believe that, and do this, and this is what this means. Um, preachers love that because usually it's laid out just perfectly. And then you go to the book of Psalms, which is made up of a bunch of songs and poems, which is a lot of symbolism, there's a lot of allegory, there's a lot of um, uh, different kinds of language, this means that, and this represents this, and uh, emotional language. And you, you understand those two, or you read those two differently. You cannot read a letter from the IRS the same way you lead a, read a letter from your loved one, or a love letter from your spouse, or your, should I say boyfriend or girlfriend, is that, is that legal here? Can I say that? I don't want to push anything. Sorry, parents. Okay? You read those differently, right? It just makes sense. You read a textbook differently than you would a song. So it makes sense that when we read it in Scripture, you're going to read those differently. Well, now you go to a narrative. You read a novel differently than you do a science book and differently than you do a popular song. And so when we look at narratives in the Bible... We have to be very, very careful because our temptation is to place ourselves directly into that story. The, the greatest example, okay, and I loved it. I couldn't wait to get to David and Goliath because preachers and, and I think just Christians in general, we totally take that story out of context. We put ourselves in the story. Our temptation is to make ourselves David and any difficulty in our life Goliath. Or the underdog of a football game is David, and the, the one who's supposed to win, that's Goliath. And so there's this underdog. You know, even, even the world, the secular world uses that David and Goliath battle. You're like putting ourselves in. That's not at all what the story of David and Goliath is all about. And if you remember when we went through that, this was the big phrase I said, you are not, Goli- uh, you are not David. You may be Goliath, actually, which is really scary. But the reality is, we're not David. If we are God's people, we're more than likely, actually, the army of Israel. The army who refused to go out and fight the enemy of God because they were scared. They couldn't do it on their own. They were too weak. This huge enemy who's going out and mocking God and mocking God's people and God's people, the army stands back and we're we're unwilling to fight that because we understand our weakness and his strength because we're focused on us. That's what the army did. And yet, what did David do? David went out as the anointed king And he fought the enemies of God. 
God anointed the anointed king to come out and fight for his people so his people did not have to fight for themselves. Because should they try to fight for themselves, they will utterly fail. So as God's people, our trust is not in us. Our trust is in the anointed king, Jesus Christ. See, see how that works? That's the story of David and Goliath. Now, the other temptation in narratives is to allegorize way too much. Like the David and Goliath, you're like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. Well, so an allegory is a story in which each character represents or symbolizes something. That's what we just did with, the, with David and Goliath, right? If you take today, so if you take today, if, well, you have to ask the question, who does David represent then in 2 Samuel chapter 1? He's the anointed king, right? But so is Saul. Saul's the anointed king. It seems like David is submitting himself to Saul as the anointed king. So you can't make David the anointed king. Saul is the anointed king. And if Jesus is the true anointed king, then which is he? Is he Saul or is he David? And who are we? Are we Saul? Are we David? Are we the armor bearer? Are we the Amalekite? You start, eventually allegory starts to fall away because then it all becomes about symbolisms. And then you could change it. That's the, okay, you're going to take, take these words. I'm using this sarcastically. The beauty of narrative and allegory is you can make it say whatever you want. That's the danger. And so you have to work hard when you're reading narratives in the Bible to not allegorize too much. There might be allegory there. There might be representation. But we always have to remember, this chapter right here, this story was not written for me, and it was not about me. Like literally not about Mark. Okay, this wasn't written down, and whoever wrote it down said, you know what, I know in like about 3,000 years, there's this guy named Mark who's going to read this, and I know he's going to have a hard time. So I'm writing this for him. No, this was actually written for the nation of Israel at the time that David was becoming king. And it was compiled together later on when Israel is in exile in Babylon. All these stories, all these books were brought together, these narratives, these Old Testament narratives. That's who it was written for. It wasn't written for me and it wasn't written for you. Does that mean that it doesn't apply to us and that we have nothing to learn from it? No, that's not, that's not what that says. You were not David. You were not Saul. You're not the armor bearer, and you're not the Amalekite directly. <laughs> but if you can sit back and we go, okay, so then. If we can't allegorize too much, and especially if the narrative doesn't hold up to us using that interpretation, and I don't want to make the, the water too muddy. Uh, you see how I did that? A little allegory there. So how do we handle this? How do we bring this? If I'm not David, if I'm not Saul, if I'm not these other characters, okay, how do I handle 2 Samuel chapter 1 or any narrative? Here's, you gotta, you gotta figure out what's the point. What is the author of the narrative trying to say to the nation of Israel through these words? We have to figure out what is he wanting to teach the original audience and then take that teaching and then bring it into our lives as God's people and say, okay, so now what can I learn from this? So in this case, the Lord's anointed king, Saul, is holy and sacred to the Lord and raising your hand against him brings judgment of death. That's the point of this story. So when David's coming to power, and this is written, and the people hear this, and they know David is God's anointed king, to stand up and resist him says what? You are against God, and you're bringing upon yourself the judgment of death. That's, that's pretty powerful. It's pretty powerful. And you say, well, then that's just David using it politically as propaganda. No, David did the same thing with Saul. And now David is saying, I am the rightful anointed king because God anointed me, not me. 
Did you remember the story about Samuel coming to my house and he anoints me? And what did I do? I didn't try to usurp Saul. I actually served him and I served him well. So you should do for me because you should not raise your hand against the Lord's anointed. That makes sense, right? Okay, now let's bring it to today, applying it to our lives today. In Acts chapter 4, 26 and 27 calls Jesus the Lord's anointed. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Lord's anointed. That's not a mistake. It's not a coincidence. At the end of the, of the Bible, Revelation 19, 16 proclaims Jesus as the King of kings and Lord, Lord of lords. And so Jesus, Jesus Christ is the one whom Saul and David were pointing to in their lives. Yes, they were the anointed kings of Israel, but the point was not to point Israel to them, but to the true anointed king who one day come and perfectly lead his people. Because Saul was an utter failure. And David, let's be honest, he wasn't a perfect man. And he wasn't a perfect king. He wasn't a perfect father. He wasn't a perfect husband, but he was faithful to God. And even these imperfect men, as God's anointed they are not to point to themselves. Their lives were meant to point to the true anointed king. They may have been God's anointed, but they were but a dull reflection of the true anointed king, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. And so because Jesus is the Lord's anointed, then how we today as God's people see and treat Jesus is vital. You see how... This is not about me. It affects me, though. Are we like David, who treated the Lord's anointed with honor and respect and reverence? Or are we like the Amalekite, who had contempt, dishonor, and irreverence for the Lord's anointed? If Jesus is the true anointed king of God's people, who fulfilled the call to save God's people from his enemies, Satan, sin, and death, then there are consequences to how we see and how we treat his anointed king. Those who show contempt and hatred to Christ will receive eternal death, for that is the judgment of all who reject him. For the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23. You say, wages of sin. Well, what is sin? Sin is disobedience. Sin is is rebellion against God himself. And what do we earn from rebellion against God? Death, eternal death. To reject Christ, and I mean to truly reject him with all of your heart, mind, and soul from now until the day you die, is to receive the judgment of eternal death away from the presence of God's mercy and God's love. But those who show honor and respect to Christ will receive eternal life. For that is the judgment for all who believe and submit to his rule as their king. For the wages of sin is death, but, most beautiful word in all scripture. I love that word, but. Yeah, the wages of sin is death, but. But. The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our to submit to Christ, and I mean truly submit to him with all of your heart, mind, and soul from now until the day you die. Notice I didn't say live a perfect life. It's submitting to him and his rule and his love and his ways is to receive the judgment of eternal life in the presence of God's mercy and love. Now, it would be very easy for us to see these two choices of showing contempt or honor to Christ as the end of our salvation or the means, if you want to say, uh, from the wrath of God for our sinful rebellion against him. Okay, in other words, if I, if I just showed Christ's honor and not contempt, then, then I'll be saved, right? Like if, if I'm just a good person, if I go to church and I try to obey his commands, then God will be pleased with me. He'll be happy and he will save me. That would be wrong, 
Because that type of leading leads to moralism, which is doing good in hopes of earning Christ's favor, or legalism, obeying Christ in order to earn his favor. And we would be no different than the Amalekite who brought news of Saul's death. Just trying to act the part, but our heart is not changed. See, the Amalekite thought that he would just say or do something to earn David's favor, but his actions actually proved to David that his heart was far from desiring to honor the Lord's anointed. We cannot simply be good enough or obey enough in order to receive Christ's favor and then be saved from God's wrath for our sin. It doesn't work that way. Throughout all of history, from the beginning of Adam and Eve, it has utterly failed to do to do it that way. There has to be a heart change. In other words, instead of attempting to obey or do good things to earn Christ's favor, we obey him and we do good things because we already have Christ's favor. We don't need to earn God's favor. We don't need to earn it. He's already given it to us. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. It doesn't say Christ died for us. And so then we're no longer sinners. It's, we are sinners. We were sinners before he died for us. While we were in rebellion against him, he gave his life and shed his blood for us. See, the truth is made clear in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And I know we keep going to that passage over and over and over again, but but I see it as the clearest and more under, most understandable explanation of the gospel message of salvation through Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. You see, the grace of God, the salvation of us by God and our faith in God are all gifts of God to us while we were still sinners while we were still in rebellion against him. They are those things, his grace, his salvation, and the faith that he gives us, none of it is ours. None of it is our works. Nothing of our doing can give us them. They are a result of God's free gift to us so that no one can boast of their own good works or obedience of Christ. If our salvation from God's wrath for our sins could be earned by us, then we would certainly be right in giving ourselves the credit. But there would be no need for Jesus then. If I can earn God's favor, then why would Christ have to die? Why would Christ have to be obedient? Our faith, His grace, and our salvation are given to us by Christ. And so he gives us, or we give him the credit. He gets the credit from us. You say, well, didn't you just say that how we respond to Christ as the Lord's anointed king determines whether we receive eternal life or eternal death? Yes, that's true. This, that is absolutely true. But the only way that we can choose to respond to Christ is with, with honor and submission and not contempt and disobedience for God is to, to have our hearts changed from rebellious to obedient. And we can try to live a good life. We can try to be moral. And then something happens in life and uh, yeah, we see how that works out, right? When you try to be perfect, as my dad said growing up, how's that working out for you? It doesn't work. We have to be perfect, perfectly obedient. And so the only way for us to actually be obedient to God, because we're imperfect in our obedience to God without him, is for him to give us the gift to change our hearts, to be softened by him so that our hearts will then freely accept that gift of grace and salvation and faith. You see, see how that works? In and of ourselves, what, what, what can I do? I, I can't do anything until God changes my heart. 
he gives this gift to those whose hearts are changed by him. He saves us. And so then we can say, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So does your heart and life reveal your contempt and hatred for Christ as the Lord's anointed? Only you can really look at the depths of your heart, right? We can, we can all put on a good mask of obedience and moralism and legalism and look the part. We do it really well. You ever come across somebody that you're irritated with and you put on this face of, of like you're really happy to see them? Oh, come on. You're all looking at me like I'm not going to admit that. Of course you do. Of course you do. And you say, well, I'm showing them grace. We put on a mask. We do it really, really well. I'm not saying it's right. We do it, though. The question is not whether just our lives do it, because eventually our lives are going to reveal where our heart lands. And if our heart is changed, if we believe in our hearts that God raised Christ from the dead, that he is the Savior, he is the anointed king, we will be saved. And so, again, does your heart, what do your heart and your life reveal? Contempt and hatred for Christ? Then you will earn, all you will earn is eternal death and hell away from God's mercy and grace. That is not a popular message, but that's the truth. We cannot leave this place without expressing the truth of God's redeeming power to save us and the utter folly of trying to save ourselves. We are not here for self-help. God loves you, just work harder. No, it's God loves you, and so he's changing you so that you can be more obedient to him. If your heart and your life reveal your honor and love for Christ as the Lord's anointed, then hear these words. Stand firm in the confidence that you have already received the favor of the king and eternal life in heaven is already yours. You already have it and nothing can take it away. That's where the joy comes in. We submit to the anointed king we love and we honor because God has changed our hearts and we go to him instead of ourselves. We receive the joy of eternal life. Yes, I will die from this earth, but my soul will live forever in the presence of God in heaven. And so you have to ask yourself this question, which am I? Which one am I? Again, if you... If you realize that you don't love Christ, you hate him, you might put on a good mask, but man, deep down, you just, you despise, you despise the Bible, you despise his commands, you just want to do your own thing. Man, that's, that, that's a dangerous place to be. And you are in danger. I can't see your heart. I can't, I can't say you're not saved. I mean, your life may not be showing it. You know your heart, and God knows your heart. Hear his words, submit to him. Stop trying to earn his favor and just bask in him. And the ironic thing, when you let go of that, he changes your heart. He's changing your heart. And so you submit to him, then you receive that joy. You receive the contentment of no matter what happens in life, good or bad, God's got it in his hands because I am his. I'm his. I belong to him. I belong to the anointed king. So I don't normally do this, okay? Because I, I trust God's sovereignty. And of course, that totally sounds like now that I'm going to change things, I don't trust God's sovereignty. That is not true, okay? The worship team, why don't you guys come forward? You're going to play that last song. We have to sing. Um, there is a fountain. Filled with blood. Okay, that's super gruesome, right? You're like, why are we singing this? This is like a fountain just totally filled to the brim with blood. That's disgusting. Well, you got to go through the rest of the song. That when a believer, when someone who su submits to Christ, 
the believer who is saved is, is not just splashed with the blood of Christ. They are utterly surrounded and submerged within that huge vat of blood of Jesus Christ, which is, okay, I'd say allegory for the fact that he covers every single one of your sins, past, present, and future. Every single one. If you are a child of God, how can you have that confidence? Because God's word says, Jesus' blood covers all sin once and for all. So there's nothing in your life right now or even tomorrow, a sin that will remove that blood because it is so overwhelming and so covering your body as a child of God. There is nothing, there's nothing that could take you out of that fountain. And those words, don't look at the gruesomeness of it. I mean, I guess in one way you can, but what I'm trying to say is look at the beauty of those words. There is a fountain filled with blood and that blood covers every single one of my sins. It doesn't give me freedom to just go ahead and sin and do whatever I want tomorrow or today. It's, they're covered. (laughs) 